All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started while people are, are getting on pizza here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. We're so excited to be uh, hosting um, Professor uh, Lori Zola with us here. Um, this is just awesome to see the club grow like this since January. Uh, that's when this thing started. So, uh, so that's really incredible. Um, but yeah, so we're going to actually skip the newsreel today. Uh, so at, at Isaac's. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's going out to Listserv, and it'll be available on the website as well, which if you don't know what I mean when I say the Piedmont website, you can check it out. It's on the, all, the bottom of all our flyers. Uh, and so be sure to check that out. Uh, and with that, I think I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Lori. We're looking forward to a good discussion, so we want to reserve as much time as possible for that. Um, so we're, as I said, we're uh, absolutely thrilled to have uh, Lori with us today. She's the pro she's a professor of bioethics and humanities at Northwestern uh, Fine Arts School of Medicine, al along with a number of other appointments here. Uh, she's been honored as the Charles McCormick Deering Professor of Teaching Excellence. Uh, she was president of the uh, American Academy of Religion, president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. She was the first ethicist on NASA's National Advisory Board. Uh, she published a book in 1999 on uh, healthcare and ethics of encounter on justice, health policy, and ethics uh, of, of community. Uh, she's testified before state and federal commissions on issues in emerging scientific research. Um, she is now serving on the Recombinant DNA Board, or at least has. Okay, yeah, that's right. Four years as uh, the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, which is one of the highest uh, points for, uh, for, for someone in her field uh, at, at the national level. Uh, she was the founding director of the Center for Bioethics, Society, and Policy, uh, also a founding director of the Brady Program in Ethics and Civic Life uh, here at Northwestern. Uh, what she'll be talking about today is her uh, recent work uh, entitled Should We Synthesize the Human Genome? Uh, it was written along with Drew Endy uh, and published in Cosmos uh, and has been quickly quoted all around the internet and as, as one of the primary pieces uh, or one of the counter voices to, to HGP Right or the Human Genome Project Right. Uh, which has been sent out to uh, on the listserv if you guys want to read that paper, if you haven't already, uh, as well as Lori's response to it. All right, uh, with that, I'll let her take it there. Okay, okay so I want to tell you a story, and the story has to do with the fact that I've been friends with Randy for a long time, um, and the fact that I've worked in the, in the set of biology really since, really since the beginning. In bio 2.0, when um, when Arkin, because Arkin and, and, and Jake Healing, he's invited me to UC Berkeley to think about this new thing called synthetic biology, right? Which I thought was really cool, like all of you, because you are concerned. And it was quite interesting that synthetic biology had bioethics at the very beginning. The very beginning. Now, as you know, it's an amorphous group. These, these the distributed collectives that gather together at 2.0, now it's 9.0. This coming year. And yet they've always had bioethics in the beginning. So I got a phone call um, last year from Drew. And we've argued about a lot of things, but he did call me up and he said, something's happening that you need to know about. Maybe I'm crazy, but I'm worried it's not ethical, so I better talk to you. So I'm going to walk you through this story. Um, and what happened was, in May of this year, there was a secret meeting to discuss this proposal, which you have in your listing. And this paper came out afterward. That was one of the problems of the, um, the sequence of the event. And this was a proposal that because we now can synthesize cheaply, right, we can now synthesis become cheaper, then it was possible to do a large-scale coordinated scientific effort to understand, discuss, and apply large genome engineering. Right? The idea was, in the paper, Let's just do this large genome engineering. It, and the reason why they didn't say human at the very beginning was because of the controversy around it. Um, and it's not moving happily again. Oh, there. Okay. So here's the rationale. The first rationale was we can read. Now we can read the human genome, and then we should write it. Now we can read it, then we should write it. And that paper basically made it. The premise is that. The Human Genome Project, in both its public and private forms, was a success. It kept being a success you know, at every point when they kept writing them more, reading more. And that the synthesis is cheap. And they've already begun the yeast genome. And they're beginning now to have the hair eye organisms. And they now can we move to larger, to larger sequences of genes, more interesting. And they 
it was not just a theory. So as you can see, if the cost reduction continues, the price would be $100,000 in only 20 years, which, if you wanted to make your own genome, is about the cost of going to a restaurant for you. So not an impossible amount of money. <coughs> now, and the other rationale was this. Only a human genome is going to be funded. And this is because the people that are largely funding science are gee whiz entrepreneurs. It used to be, when I started being a bioethicist, that science was funded in two ways. The NIH and HHMI. Those are the big funders. And then there was some private patient groups, but now it's a considerable amount of money that people are donating, keep being asked you know, the rules for that, and they keep in new ways of funding science. And the private funders need to be both excited and somewhat self-interested. They want to make a human genome, they want to fund a human genome, and they're going to be excited about doing it. Why? Why? Why does Elon Musk or someone want to do this? Or the Autodeck. Autodeck funded this project. That millions already on this. Why does Autodeck, Mr. Autodeck, want to do this? And that makes software. Make money. Make money. Always a good idea. What else? Maybe make replaceable organs. Replace that idea that somehow replaceable cells. That you can somehow fix yourself and know yourself and live at least extended, if not forever, right? So that's what's behind it. Now, the third rationale was hey, we need new tools anyway. Now, I agree with this idea. I think synthetic biology is good, right? And, but the idea was that you needed this grand challenge, and it only could be human, to move forward, right? And new technologies are actually essential for advancing basic biological science. And that, if you just advance basic biological science, who knows what you might come up with, right? We could agree with this, except this is what we call the scratch of the king's banquet argument. Like, even if you give a lot of money to the king, and he has a big fancy pizza banquet, look, there'll be scraps left over for the, for the small and impoverished children that cluster about, and isn't that a good thing, right? And of course, it'd be a much better thing to give pizza directly to the small and impoverished children, right? But this, the argument is, see, it's a good thing because the, the leftovers will come for random scientists. It's, it's a bad argument for philosophy. But can you do this? The fact that you might be able to, does that imply that you must or that you ought to? That's the question. Now, usually, the joke is, this is a philosophy joke, they're not very funny. Philosophers say, you can't say someone has to do something. You can't suggest an ought, because an ought implies a can. You can't say, I should give all the money of Northwestern away to the, those small poor children who want pizza. Right? Unless I actually could make it happen. Because otherwise it's an empty gesture. That's why this is a joke. Right? So just because you can do it, doesn't mean you ought to do it. Right? And the first question that wasn't asked, but should have been asked, and that was the point of our article, is, is this the right act, and what makes it so? Why, what's the real rationale? Why is a human genome important to make now? Okay, here are the applications. First of all, the process was Right now, there's, there's private meetings in science. I'm invited to private meetings. I'm sure you you are, or other people, you've heard about private meetings, so you can find private meetings. But there's not secret meetings in science. And that's the difference. There are invitation-only meetings, but the meeting to talk about the paper, to create a paper, was held after the paper was written, had been submitted, and had been vetted. And the reason why was because the scientists said so. They, they, when it was found out they were having a secret meeting, it was revealed the paper was already in the industry. So that's a lot. Um, and the participants weren't told this. Secondly, um, the meeting was secret. The participants were all told not to reveal it. And the press was excluded because of they had said in the invitation, the press will somehow make it odd, and we won't be able to talk freely. Right? And I'm talking about like, senior science reporters in the New York Times, who, as you can imagine, felt sad about this. But even having a, a, a big meeting like this in the press is actually quite unusual. Um, it can happen, but you don't keep it, you can say, we're having a meeting about synthetic biology, we're having a meeting about this new important project, we'll talk to you later, but you don't pretend it's not happening. And tell them, tell the press, oh no, nothing's happening at home. Um, and in fact, business people, entrepreneurs, and, and the legal people in bioethics were invited. None of the people who have been Following the field or involved in SynBio 2 through 9 were invited. No one in Synberg was invited, but people who did legal patenting were invited. So that was off, right? Who was in and who wasn't. Um, and finally, they said it was going to be a video made, but that promised to show us the video and stream it. 
We really still haven't seen the path. Did you see the map? Yeah. It's out now. So, so some, some of it's out. Uh, oh. Some of it is like exactly. under embargo. Right. Pump, yeah. but. right. So that's weird, right? Like, if you're going to go, oh, we want you all to see this, then basically the worst, actually. But, but some things can be shown. Because, like, what's not there? What was so secret and private? 20 to 30 minutes from the Bible, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's up. Uh, the Bible discussion wasn't planned. It wasn't on the original agenda. It had to be ad added over lunch, which shows the enormous importance of <laughs> the Bible discussion. The same thing was about humility and hubris. We don't want science to be arrogant. Already, the American public barely trusts scientists anymore, right? I mean, already DDT could have been, we could have done much more with Zika and malaria if we were allowed to spray DDT, which we can't. We can't have nuclear power as an option because no one trusts anyone to keep it safe or tell the truth about it, right? That's just the reality that you're facing. And this makes it somewhat worse. Um, scholars of the actual Human Genome Project, the people who actually read it, um, among them, Richard Lipton, who we just gave um, an honorary degree in Northwestern to, said that we can't even, we don't understand it. The idea that we can read it, so therefore we can write it, is nonsense. We can't read it. We're not going to want to read it for, he said, a decade, maybe more decades. We don't understand it even just the sequences. We don't understand it for genetics. Right? We just don't have it yet. And to say, oh, we can read it, therefore we can write it, is an example of a conceptual leap that is problematic. Um, there's no principle in philosophy, and there's no principle in linguistics that because, or certainly in science, because you can observe something and make sense of it, that you can then create it. That's just not a principle in philosophy. And if, you, if you're like me, and I can read Spanish really well, but constructing a Spanish sentence in the past tense always eludes me. You have to read it. Right? So there you go. There's a different set of skills. It's not, it's not sequential. Um, to me, that was the yeast, there's levels of complexity, but all also have to be worked out before people try to try to build the thing. Um, suggestions in the papers, you'll see, are made about stem cells and ultra-safe cells that really have no relationship to stem cell science. I, I spent many years thinking about human embryonic stem cells. It was a rough time for bioethics, and I know what stem cells can do and can't do, and I know, in fact, that to replace a stem cell with a perfect cell is not at all the goal of stem cell science. The, the trick that we're trying to do with stem cell science is a universally acceptable stem cell, not a brand new one with a made up other sequence. You see, so it's not, they're not even speaking to the people that they're claiming to work with. You need to do the same thing with the organ transplantation. It doesn't help the problem with organ transplantation. But here's some of the claims that you'll see that this ultra safe cell that we're going to make, that it would be virus resistance, improve cancer resistance. Now, here's number three. These other useful traits, we're not sure what they meant by that, of what sort of useful traits. Here they say prion cell destruction, but what other sort of traits? Do they feel they can encode in a human genome, a human genome now, that would then enact itself as a trait? Um, genomic stability, um, applications that go to cell lines of stem cell therapy, the person that wouldn't be, and the robust production of biologics, all of these things. Notice the term fail safe security. As a biologist, I'm always nervous when scientists promise me anything that's going to be fail-safe um, right, by removing transcriptive regulators, as if this was a known thing. So all you have to do is flip off the, trans the regulators, the transcriptive regulators, the ventilation process, and, and it would happen. I mean, it shows that, in really, that they don't understand some of these critical issues in stem cell biology. Now, this is a problem, by the way, in biological engineering. If you come from an engineering background and you encounter biology, Biology is messy. Right? It's messy. And the first few years of stem cell science was engineers trying to make wiring diagrams and biologists sort of wandering through and saying, it doesn't work like that, right? And that's why the early, all the other work really was hard to right? So the question we want to ask is what is a good app that makes it so? Who will benefit from this and who risks harm? What are counts as valuable truths? Uh, what kinds of people are the bearers of truth? Who are these scientists? What's the relationship between expertise and authority? Um, what sort of social order is applied by the technology? What's the proper goal of biotech? Is the process of creating the technology transparent, and rational, and fair? How is the process by which you're doing it linked to the premise, the telepremise of where you're going to go? Okay? What do you think about this? <coughs> this is a, a classic way of philosophers to think about it. You know, 
Pelican is your enemy, too, as your enemy. But you didn't know what I was telling you. I know it was the end of the book. Now notice what's here. One of the problems with this was this was George Church. Now I like George Church. He's a great scientist. He's been really interesting. But he does, he was the woolly mammoth guy. Right? He was the Neanderthal person. We should have had a Neanderthal. So he told a lot of these stories. So it was a little hard to figure out at first whether this was a regular a George Church fantasy to get us interested, a useful idea, or an actual project. That was one of the things that happened. The bearers of truth count. Um, the social order implied by technology, what going to a human genome before you've done, say, a rice genome, before you've made weighed one up, they they read it, but they created one. That's an interesting choice, right? It implies a social order in which the humanity, right, making a better human is at the center. Okay. So what next time is ethical? How can you make me happy? I think these four things. Um, it is, it doesn't have the hubris. Its aim is largely to reduce suffering and not to make money. Um, it's aware of all burdens and benefits, but not only that, but understanding the politics and the power relationships. It is, in the process, transparent and just. And I believe it has to be publicly funded and publicly funded. I think when you have private funding mixed up with science, Something else is happening than publicly available science. I think it's not impossible. It's not impossible to do it with fairness, but it's extremely difficult. It raises a conflict of interest that's quite serious. And for me, this is the most important thing, which is the kind of science I want to see happen is the kind of science that makes the world better. Like that's why we give you all this money. And that's why we give you all this power. Right? We don't do it because we like scientists. Frankly, Shakespeare scholars are interesting people. We give it to you for one reason, we being the public funding, right? The public is funding is towards science, especially in medical science, because we want the world to be better, we want to be less suffering. That's the whole point, right? So that's why you're funded. <laughs> um, and if you make the world, and if you're going to benefit from it, you are responsible. So a duty to prepare process is problematic. For instance, Humboldt, when he did his explorations, of Latin America, he saw that there was already degradation of the forest and the pampas because of colonialism, was the use of the, the land was being destroyed by the kind, the kind of industrialization that the Spanish and the British were already doing. So it's not like we don't understand the climate change that is linked to production, but the issue of global climate change now is the central problem of our time. It's the central moral problem of our time. And if you're making a new thing, you make it in the world that is haunted by this impending tragedy. So, you come from Louisiana, and you saw the floods, like, what are you doing, scientists, if you're not attending to the critical moral problem of our time? Right? What are you doing, really, if you're doing something else? You're not alleviating suffering. It's a problem. So, um, we're asking you a very complicated question about a number of different things you're doing with a spectrum of contextual environments. And all of your work is high risk and high reward. Another ethical issue was this did not pay attention to the moral status of humans. Now, a moral status issue is what happened with stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. Because to get human embryonic stem cells, you had to destroy an embryo. And in the later stage of science, it wasn't leftover embryos, it was constructed embryos, right? That they were made, be researched on, and then destroyed. And people felt strongly, not just, by the way, not just the Roman Catholic Church, but many of the scientists themselves, including um, uh, Chidi Yamanaka, said, you'd have to be crazy not to feel something morally problematic when you destroy a human embryo. And of course, that you don't have to be a Roman Catholic to feel something when that happens. And so that moral status issue haunted human embryonic stem cell research. It haunts this as well. When you make a new human genome out of parts, like Lego land, what is it that you've done in terms, of, in terms of humanity? And that's even if you don't believe that the moment of conception is the moment of, of personhood, there's some status in it. And people feel differently about the genome, the embryos, people even feel like the heart or brains are the self. So whenever you do research that involves these self-identity issues, it becomes a moral status problem. 
Um, and the, the capacity to make it raises issues of power. Not just theological, but philosophical. Can you make a human person outside of the normative processes of reproductive sex? What's it mean to make a human genome in some completely ex-corporal way? Um, actually, I think I'm here to force the shadow of history. What is this like? One of the ways that a philosopher looks at emerging science says, and says, what is this like? So, frequently enough, this was a lot like the earlier uses of genetics. And why do we get this? You'll see the language is to find a perfect cell, an ultra-safe cell, or a template, to find a norm. So what human genome are you going to make? Whose? Right? Is it me? Is it Barack Obama? Is it George Church? Or whose genome is it? Right? I mean, how old is it? Is it able-bodied, or disabled, gay, straight? I mean, what's the story? What is a normal human genome? And what happens when you begin to have that as a, as a linguistic construction and a physical construction? It's very close. It's not the same. It's not Nazis. But it's very close to the room in which those experiments took place, right? Um, it leads to this idea. And here you have these eye charts. And they were trying to find, this was um, you know, right before the, the Holocaust, they were just trying to order what the world looked like. And of course, once you begin to categorize human eye color, right? Now this was, what's interesting is, this is a Nuremberg <coughs> chart, right, about curlingness of hair, and notice the sort of fake biology of this, fake genetics, and this was done in, in Norway, right? This idea that there was a better, bluer eye, a more normal eye, the shape of the eye, was somehow linked to traits, was a very powerful idea throughout the first part of the 20th century. It wasn't just like Nazis that had this idea, it was Californians that had this idea. Right? So this is a widespread idea, and now we see this as the normative, calling something normal implies, implies better. Right? It slides right over to the most normal becomes the person you want to be. Um, the fifth issue has to do with justice. Already, the world of IVS, IVF, artificial reproduction technology, is outside of most standard um, norms of Justice to distributed justice. It's covered, but it's expensive. And right now, you can, <laughs> you have to compete for um, the quality of eggs. If you go to school at Stanford, your eggs can be sold for more money. Harvard Stanford eggs worth more than Northwestern eggs. Sorry, but it's marketplace, right? There you go. And it's very easy in this world of competitiveness, of crazy competitiveness, to say if you can make a perfect and normal genome. Right, what does that cost? How much would that cost? How much would that be worth? Um, the product, the project becomes a product, right? To create a genome and you put it in a human cell, what have you done? You've made a thing that can then be owned and bought and sold. And who determines what is useful, right? And why are we making a human genome and not a more interesting genome? Uh, or that could store fuel or something. What about that choice? So there's two sorts of justice issues. So here's what we need to ask. This just came from many years ago. In 1999, um, several of us got together who were doing research for scientists and, and philosophers and theologians and said, around every new technology, any new technology, whatever they come up with, what are the questions that need to be asked? Not the Frankenstein questions, and really not even the Nazi questions, <coughs> right? Because those can be addressed and solved. Those are science fiction fantasies. These are the questions that you need to ask about any new technology, a general new technology like this would be. What is the principal reason why it should be impermissible? What's the principle that we have? And here you can see we don't want to create human persons in an extracorporeal um, way in a lab in the hands of individuals, funded by private money. Right? That's a principle. Somehow this, the human genome. It is something special, there's something distinct about it, and it can never be made into a product. That might be a principle. Um, what contextual factors should be taken into account? And the contextual factor has to do with, for instance, the marketplace exchange of human gametes already. We could say introducing yet another form of production that might not be fair, right? might not be available to everyone, is a bad, it puts in a bad context. The other context is the shadow of history. Right? We live in a world that's deeply torn by race deeply torn by class, 
really do you want to give technology that would make these perfect, super ultra safe, you know, capacitive organisms to the people that can fund them and all this stuff? Isn't that a little disturbing? Why not? Isn't that a context that's disturbing? What purposes or techniques? Right? And here's where you wonder what sort of genome should we make? You can make a genome. Should it be human or should it be another useful genome that human beings could use to change the suffering of the world? And then finally, who produces it? Who's in charge? Are these the scientists you want to try? Should scientists be in charge? Should it be public? Should it be some government body? Who, who regulates this sort of research? And those are four serious questions that need to be asked about any kind of genomic or genetic interventions or techniques. Can we go back to our valuable truth that we've seen before? Oh, I've done this. Okay. Um, all, all articles I write, almost all of them, ask for a national discourse. And that's not enough. It's interesting. Right? But everyone says, oh, we need a national discourse. But who needs to come? And here you can see that one of the problems of this human genome right project was who was invited? Were the people invited who would be already approving them? The entrepreneurs who saw it as a way to make money. The lawyers who were looking for patent <coughs> right? You can see there's three or four ethicists who had never been exposed. They weren't working in the biology, only one was, and they had to have a lunch discussion. Who was invited? How was the discussion held? Um, how is this related to other important projects? If you're going to do this in the name of organ transplantation, if you're going to do this in the name of stem cell biology, oughtn't you have stem cell scientists there and, and organ transplant surgeons there to see if it's even something that they want, something that they, within their expertise, understand as a useful intervention? And then the question I have is for you is, well, what else? What do you think would make this idea more than just kind of cool or disturbing, but actually moral or morally acceptable? Um, and then I just want to thank you for helping me think about some technology. I'm talking to George Church, who spent a lot of time teaching me how about his work and opening his lab to my to my visits, and so people who've actually helped me think this through, both pro and con on this idea. Okay, that's all I have, and now it's your turn. Because I think the American system of capitalism is fundamentally rigged, it's fundamentally corrupt. If Bill and Melinda Gates had to pay a fair amount of taxes on their enormous wealth, like millions and millions every cent that we sit here, right? That, that'd be much more money than they've done. They've done it in any micro they've done it. It's very nice. Very nice that they've done it. Very good. But you know what? They should be they should pay some fair amount of taxes, just like how much does it should. And they don't. Oh, they don't. Right? Every time you use word, you know, can you imagine how much money they actually make? Right? And how, so it, it's just that it's not, it's still not fair. That if there was a fair tax system, then we'd have plenty of money, not only for science, but for infrastructure, for, you know, for public education. So if you're funding it publicly, then you're having individual people with a board of like minded people coming together and deciding how they're going to have use their wealth. And I, you know, they don't have, their board isn't made up of like trade union members and PTA members. They're made of, you know, people like that. People in a certain class and a certain position. And so then they make the decision of what they want in the world. And they're doing great stuff. They're funding a lot of malaria work. And that's true. A lot of vaccine work. That's terrific. But I still don't think it's enough. Right? And that's, I think still at all it's not enough. And I don't think it's a matter of charity. I think it's a matter of justice. And if it's a matter of charity, Right? Then they can, you know, the kind of decisions they make may be different from the kind of decisions you make. But that's why I don't like that. Right. Even, even for good people. <laughs> because, it, it, yeah, it's just not enough. It's just not enough. Yes? You mentioned the East Genome Project as well as a potential, let's say, Rice Genome Project. Mm -hmm. um, but those are surely subject to similar types of analysis by ethicists, so can you walk us through okay. how you would compare that? Uh, Rice, let's say you said, 
let's make a child, let's write the genome of rice, right? And the reason we want to write it is we want to change the fact that it has to be grown in patterns with enormous amounts of individual and very specific labor, right? Let's say that it could grow um, in deserts. That could happen. Let's say you could do that, right? You're probably just as likely that you could make it human. <laughs> and if you, could think, if you said you were doing this in a name of people who really need certification areas, who need something different about their food growth, then there would be, would be a rationale that's different. I don't know what the rationale is for this for human. I just don't see it. It doesn't, I mean, I know about stem cell science, I know about organ transplantation, it doesn't address those issues. I'm not sure how that would really help. Because they can't make organs of fish, right? They can't. Maybe at some point, but like at that point, but right now we're just, we're just light years away from this being a project for organ stem cells. So there's no really applicable reason. Maybe you can imagine how writing the plant genome. Be interesting. When I asked that question to some of the scientists, Jeff Bucky, he said, well, no one's going to fund that. <laughs> because entrepreneurs, they are not interested in that. So that's, that's one thing. If you said, if you had a discussion and said, okay, it's a, it's a tricky technology, and it implies a lot of power, and it makes sort of music, creates a different way of speciation for the world, right? But where is it worth the risk? And it might be for food, it might be something around that doesn't harm each other. That's then it's worth it. But for, for human genomes, just because it's kind of, kind of exciting, and it's, then I don't think it's justified to do this. Yeah? So if I could just clarify this point, it's not that you think that all research must be directed towards some sort of producing some known harm. It's the research that's like ethically challenging that you need to be clear about what the benefit is. Well, I don't think you need to be clear about the benefit. In I think, I think, I think the basic, basic usage is totally permissible. It's like art, right? Like, like, like I don't think when anybody writes a poem has to be treated malaria. That's all about poems about malaria. And that, I, mean, you know, I think there's, there's a huge category of basic research, but this wasn't basic research. Actually, if they had said, we just want to tool around with the genome and see what we can do, that would have been different. But they said, oh, we just want to, like, right? Some they said we want a human, some they told them to become a large one. So they, they were very clear about it. So the funder, the audit side, was very clear about what he wanted. He wanted to make those promises. He wanted tissue, he wanted something with stem cells. So that was, that I think is, that, that's what he was talking about. And, quite frankly, if you're going to go to the American public and you want a huge amount of money, and you have six different projects that you can possibly fund, yeah, you might want the one that rates social good. Um, what I'm interested in is, um, is the um, Humphrey Davies. Anyone know who he is? Come on, chemists. No? Humphrey Davies? Okay, now Humphrey Davies is like a poor kid in Cornwall, and um, he's, he did this, this um, interesting first analysis of gases. Like, someone had to find these elements, and someone had to make understand gases, and that was Humphrey Davies. And he was the first um, head of the Royal Society after Banks. Thanks, Lady Davies. And when he decided, when he would receive visitors, he got the miners union and the clergy from northern England because it wasn't safe because of the gases and the swamp gases and the mines, and they were dying. And so Humphrey Davies goes out down to the mines, both in Cornwall and northern England, and he figures out how to make the Davies lamp. The Davies lamp, the Davies lamp was, was used for three generations of miners. And it meant that it didn't blow up. It had a way of venting the gases so that they used open flames so it didn't explode. And he did it because he understood gases and nobody else did. And he turned to science to address the needs of the people who came before him and said, no, the miners are not. Right? So that's the kind of that's the kind of relationship you want with people. And no one's clamoring for any of you. <laughs> the Archie knows are fun. Especially oddly enough, because this came, this all happened. Six months after CRISPR Cas9 was held, we had, had a big meeting by CRISPR Cas9 at the National Academies. And that was a model of how this would happen, right? Lots and lots of people were invited, about 100 and something people were invited. It was very open. The meeting was open. It was live stream, right? And you could, you, people had a chance to talk about it for three days. 
It wasn't hot. The press was there. Everybody discussed it. Big panels on ethics. Big panels on patients. Panels on science. A big open discussion about CRISPR Cas9. Should it be used to modify human organs? Okay. So the answer was no, we're not ready. And, and that's the kind of discussion that was possible to have. Six months later, there was a secret, a secret meeting, this whole other thing rolls out, and it's not even clear to me what this could do over modification of existing of our own, the, the actual wild type. Yeah. So, I, so you've talked to George Church, and some, some of this has surprised me given his earlier statements his whole push for making everything public yes. with his own personal genome, which has other issues with that too. But and then also, I know earlier in his career, when there's discussion of sequencing uh, and annotating genomes, uh, he advocated for smaller genomes. Yes. So I just was wondering. I, I know you can't fully speak for George, but like, what is is there a change of mind or? Um, I think I think. People came to him and thought it was an exciting project and asked about it. But I, I, I think he, he's totally willing to talk about this and have a come and have talks about it and be convinced about it. And I think it's one of his ideas that he spins out that, are, that he likes it because it's a very cool idea. Wow, it's, it's that life is all chemistry story. You know, it's not a miracle, it's just chemistry. You've heard scientists say that or you read it. It's not a miracle, really. It's just chemistry. It's all chemistry. Life is all chemistry. Biology is chemistry. And at some level, yeah, <laughs> it's true, right? But it's, it's wildly reductionist. I think, but I think he's interested in his cousin. I, I mean, I don't think he's an, these are evil people. I, I, many of the people on that list are people that I, I care about. Pam Silver is on that list, right? Karen Isaacs is on that list. These are people who are really smart and interested. I think they're intrigued by this idea, right? And they, I don't think it was really thought through. Um, fully scientifically before it, was, before it was run out in terms of entrepreneurs and lawyers. I think that's what you see. Was the, well, I got lots of phone calls about the story, and most of the phone calls were um, entrepreneurial tech men. <coughs> and I don't know if you've ever lived in the Bay Area, but there's a tech bus. You know about the tech bus? Some people with money get on this bus. I expect it's a nice bus. <laughs> and they go from little biotech company to biotech company. Many years ago, I was at Geron. Uh, we, were, we had an ethics advisor, but at Geron, it was fun to do stem cells. And the, the tech people would come, the people with the bus would have come, and there'd be food, and they'd present their science, and then people would pack up, and then they'd go to the next little biotech company, all up and down the news And then they decide at the end what they want to fund. So it's very driven by that, by the bus. And I think that, you know, when someone comes to you, and, um, the guy who runs all the comes to you and says, could you make a human one? So I'm like, no, maybe we can. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. But I think that all the scientists who wrote it, that's on the paper, are very open to discussing them. I don't think they expected the kind of the the, um, the, the um, publicity that came from the entire do this, which was more so my happened. Yes. So as a scientist, I can understand the allure of this grand challenge, right? This, I think, this is something that a lot of us relate to. This this feeling of. Um, this quest for knowledge and what can we do? We can't do it yet, but we'd like to find out if we could. Um, so I, I can see how if someone came to me later in my career and said, hey, we're having this top secret meeting and it's going to be about making a human oh, yeah. genome, I would be, I'd be like, yes, count me in. Um, but I also see that the role of the bioethicist is completely crucial. And so I think it's important to have these discussions and to sort of <laughs> reel the scientists in a little bit. Um, but my question is, what is the role of the bioethicist and what are the tangible ways that you can impact the science being done? And do you feel like, uh, like is it only through regulatory processes or is there more that you can do? I, I hope that we don't just come after the regulatory. I hope that our ideas about what makes science good that are woven into the projects that we see. And that's what I think. When people get interested in, in like the, the best science that I've ever heard was when I was on, with, I was at HFMI, HHMI for seven years as the chair of the Bioethics Advisory Committee. And I went to every meeting, went to every single meeting. And it was an extraordinary science. Talking, I always have black on the slides, but 
Um, and the Shrigan, beautiful songs. And they, the way that it, they chose, they always started, almost always started, um, with the disease they were interested in. How does this, what's happening in humans? And then they go all the way back and tell a story, and it started with very basic research, right? Beta blockers, how'd that happen? Right? What's a put calcium work in a cell? And they, they would be doing that, but they always had in their heads, how does this play out in the real world? And I, and I do think that science has to always be connected in some way to how, it, how, the, how the real world works. That's the job, right? How does the world work? And so this was really leaping ahead. And, and I think that the, the learning what the genome is and how it drives behaviors and how it drives processes is a, it's an enormous task. And that would be enough. You don't have to write one, you know? But, and then, of course, it is a long way between this theory and this paper and something happening to have with humans, actual humans. Right? And it doesn't mean that would be that the auditors would be entrepreneurs, but something happening with their babies and their bodies. Not understanding that this is a these are these cells. Right? And when you spoke to when I spoke to Jim, she said, Well, we don't want people, we're not making people. We're just making cells, different cells. But I think that there's a, something in the top of imagination that goes right to the Cells, tissues, organisms. But I, I do think it, that's why grand challenges are cool. That's, then the, it, they came into the lexicon of science with the human genome project. <coughs> that and tragically enough pillars, which is a scholar of religious religion. And anyone talks about the five pillars, I just like really, you know, don't do that. That's a, that, because it's, it, it's a it's a term for the um, structure of Islam, and when it's hijacked by people looking for science, it's, it's um, ridiculous. Yes, I saw somebody. Uh, yeah, about the whole government, <coughs> government regulations. I mean, I mean, these ideas come out usually in a newspaper. People that yeah. really yeah. reach fruition immediately. Well, the way it works, and this is one way that violence is playing, is the CRISPR Cas9 story is a perfect example of what of science working with them. So, where does government get its ideas about science policy? Hope um, is from the National Academies. Right? So the National Academies is the structure of the advisory structure of government that says these people learn about science, and the scientists gather together, and then they tell us what should happen in space travel, what should happen in in regulation of, um, of mitochondrial DNA. I was on two panels last year. One was for mitochondrial DNA, and one was for um, sending people to Mars. And NASA wanted to know is this was this, how would we take it? this? So NASA government agency gets advice from National Academies. Right? So that's the role. So that's why the CRISPR Cas9 is held at the National Academies of China, England, and the US to advise the governments on how to create regulations and what they should be thinking about. So it's always a it's always a collaboration. But it starts at the National Academy. And it doesn't start at the secret meeting in Harvard. Right? I mean, so that's that's the difference. Yeah. But that, that's the ideal that's how it should work. And, right. And, and, and if it's private, if it's less likely to. So you have to say, Emmanuel and, and you know, bringing it back to the National Academy is a really noble thing. I mean, that's was, that was how it should work. But that's how, that's hopefully that's how it works. Now, the problem, because you, know, you can't regulate, say, you can't regulate climate science, science if you don't believe in global warming. You've got to believe in scientists to make every government involved. I'll give you another example. The recombinant DNA, all the recombinant DNA, all the gene transfer work, gene therapy, sort of work, was regulated the train came first to the recombinant DNA advisory committee, and then to the FDA. It was passed by the RAC, then to the FDA, and then it was the clinical trials. Now that was just changed, right? So no longer goes to the RAC, goes to the friendly level IRB, and then they send it to the RAC only if they were worried about it. In my latest thing I worked about, the problem. But you can see the government, someone has to do that science. And some, so maybe scientists themselves, when scientists themselves fail to do it, someone has to step in and protect you, the humans that are the, um, the material monomers. Yes? So most of we've been talking in the context of a single country, the US government and the scientists yes. system. But these are things that cross borders. Like yeah. we see China doing research with the Chinese sometimes 
England is allowing us to make recursive embryos that must be destroyed. How do we, as a global world, deal with these moral, ethical issues that sometimes aren't regulated the way we think they should be by other countries? It's a really good example. I once made a moral mistake about this, around Simpsons, around them, and I, which I assumed that China was not, was not regulated. They didn't have ethicists. And the next person I got to speak was a Chinese ethicist. You know, she was a moral philosopher compared to China, and she's scathingly in this kind of thing. Like, of course we have philosophers, what do you think? So yeah, I really believe that, and that's fundamental to understand. These countries have long established philosophic, beautiful, elegant systems too, um, and they're just sort of designed. So in Korea, when the Wusuk Wong mess happened, it was the Korean philosophers and the Korean ethicists that pulled it together, the regulators, and, and, and were able to change that system. China, when the, the Chinese scientists began to trip a CRISPR Cas9 on embryos, um, they immediately, when it didn't work out, they immediately called their national academies and said, we need to have this review. <coughs> so that's, that was the, the impulse. Not that it won't happen, but yes, there's a mechanism in every country. Countries are idiosyncratic. In Germany, because of the history that I alluded to, they're very worried about genomic and genetic research. In England, they really don't like research on animals. They're much more likely, like they did, to do to, to and become a lot of DNA in the than do something with puppies. So it's, it varies, but there's always a regulatory system. And increasingly in the global world, they work together. If you go to national meetings, international meetings, like ISSCR, stem cells, or the synthetic biology 2.0, it's largely not Americans anymore. It's largely people from other countries. So science is very global, and so is regulation. So, yeah. Yes? Um, I have a, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding your, um, the King's scraps argument in the context yeah. of this. Because I guess the way that this technology um, to me, it's basically a copying challenge, not a writing challenge. It's very similar to the Craig Venture stuff, where they develop techniques that everyone uses. And it's not like you can only use the technique to make the cell they make. You can use it for any type of right. DNA. So isn't it kind of a false equivalency to say, well, we should only focus on rice, because it's not like this technology would only be able to make a rice genome. It's, it's a technology that could be for any type of genome assembly, whatever you're talking about. Right. That's a really good argument. Then there's no need to do the genome. Like, why do you do it at all? If what you're looking well, for. Did you, did you just say that you won't get it funded unless. I well, mean, isn't there some. That was the, that, that's their argument. That, out there? that was the argument of the authors of the book. That no one will want to fund things for poor people. They'll just want to fund things. Because that's what rich Americans like to fund. And they may be true. Right? Um, that may be true. But it's a bad argument as a philosopher. You don't do stuff the rich people like just to keep them happy and hope that there'll be some like leftover scraps for the poor. I mean, it's, it, the technology would help poor and rich people. That's, that is, is, that is true. And there is some people at Hopkins, for instance, John Hopkins, the evidence is there saying, look, don't be so picky, he's a lot. Everything starts out to the rich. Let the rich get it first. And then it will drift them. Eventually everything will happen. The sphere of influence, the sphere of concern will grow. And something that, for instance, was, um, was very rare, just something that rich people had, eventually it becomes something people want, and then something people need. Right? If you look at old spine movies, you see um, these big things called cell phones. You know, big things. And now you can't imagine not having a cell phone. It would mean a cell phone, right? So that's their theory. The theory is eventually, if you let the rich people develop the technology, it will eventually trickle down. And that's an economic theory. And there's, you could certainly make a case for that. Let, it, let these embryos be developed just for the wealthy. Well, I guess, why are you um, initially assuming that it's for wealthy people? I guess I don't understand that. Connection. Because right now, to, let's say you want to make a copy of your genome. I think it would be developed for orphan diseases or anything that's very funded. It, like, I guess I don't understand why. Well, they're called orphan diseases. In, in large part, they're called orphan diseases because no one funds them. Because the drug companies don't care at all because they don't make money. Hence the term orphan disease because they have no parents. Right? That means the drug companies can't sell enough of the cure 
to make a profit. That's why they're not, that's how they don't have that research on And that's, so the question is, what would change that using this technology? And if the answer is nothing, then you could set up a situation where people with money can have an enormous different, an enormously um, advantaged health system. And we know that it's been mentioned before, right? But health, health befalls anyone. And we try to keep a system where it doesn't matter if you're rich and poor, you still get to go to the hospital, you still get good care. Right? That's, the, that's the premise of health. You know? It should be outside the sphere of enterprise. And whenever something enters this strong into the sphere of economic relations, it all worry us, it all does concern, concern us. So that's, that's some of the anxiety. You asked earlier about what ethics is doing, the ethics is raised every time, in every situation. What about the poor? What about the vulnerable? What about the disadvantaged? Because it's not for them necessarily in science. And that's one of the things that is all responsibility to do. Yeah. I wanted to ask about one of the ethical issues you brought up, uh, the shadow of history. Yeah. And to ask, even if that's possibly, um, <clears throat> if there's a concern about finding a normal or best human, mm -hmm. potentially it could be very well intentioned. But I wanted to ask about the scenario. So it's becoming appreciated that there's a lot of variation among people mm -hmm. in terms of how we respond to drugs. Okay. And so what if the motivation was to create several dozen genomes that represented large swaths of the global population to, so, such that a new drug would be tested on all 30 of them right. and to see if it worked consistently across right. people. I mean, that, that would be a good thing. Yeah. But, but it, yeah. So my question is, that kind of goes counter to the ethical issue you brought up. But well, here's the thing. It's a shadow of history, right? We just have to remember that at one time in human history, really well-intentioned scientists and really, really well-intentioned doctors got swept up into this ideology, right? 93% of the German Medical Association, like the AMA, the German, joined the Nazi party. Like really smart people, like the most highly you know, educated, really good scientists. They bought it, and, not, not, and many of them were good people. Many of them were good people. They didn't think there was anything wrong. So always to be aware that there's something about the power of science, something about the power of medicine that one time went terribly wrong, and you have to really think, and this time, am I doing it again? Am I swept up in this again? That's all, but just, again, raising the question, because this is powerful. Science is powerful. The human genome is how, Moderns think of the soul, right? I mean, in medieval, if you were classic, in, in, in you know, 1300, you'd be worried about your soul being corrupted, your soul being damaged. And now we're about DNA, because we think of it as the, the, our innermost self, our expression of ourselves, right? And that when someone says, like, you know, when Obama says, it's in our DNA to be kind or something like this, in our DNA to do this or that, people say it all the time. And it's like saying, it's my soul that leads me to this. So any kind of messing around with that, because it happened once, you have to be aware of it. And it happened because people wanted good things. Like Emma Goldman, one of my heroines, really believed in eugenics. Damn. <laughs> so it's possible that this is, has such a pull for us that we can get swept up in it again. Whenever you read that article, you say, like, you're going to have some kind of a template, what's normal and what's invariant. And then I'm going, wait a minute, maybe I'm the variant, not the normal. So you have to think about it, right? That's, especially when he talks to me, in the article, he talks about traits. And the word traits always think, hmm, right? So in the, in the same article, normality, template, traits, it's possible. So that's why it's a shadow and not, and not screaming the Nazis or something. Right? Yes? So, um, right. it's something. Yeah, but you can talk before, so go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, so my question is sort of about the sort of question of um, like whose genome do we think in science is sort of the ethical question of identity. Um, so my issue is, I think when we're looking at genomes, so if we're asking a question like, what is, what's the race of the genome, what's the thing about sexuality, if we're, I think, looking at like, the majority of the genome, I think those traits are going to be really superficial and if we like if that question is sort of a reason that we do not um, uh, try to synthesize the genome um, would that be sort of 
communicating and sort of reinforcing ideas of sort of the innateness of certain identities that are at least socially constructed and so like what do you think about that? You're a really good question. I mean, because some extent identity is always a pull. So I'm from the South Campus, and so I think of identity as culturally shaped the constructed by contextual norms. And that's just powerful as my but well, there's a very strong argument for biology. I just finished reviewing um, Hank Greeley's book, The End of Sex. A really disturbing book, actually. In which he talks about, you know, parents will be, we will be able to offer parents a choice. I'm going to use it there. We are going to offer parents a choice about blue eyes or blonde, or how smart they be, or they like music. And I'm thinking, really? That's all? What do you like music? Or what do you think is all in you? Like, really? That's, it seems a reduction. But and does our does our position reify that reductionist idea? Um, and I think it's a, you know yeah probably possibly it makes it, it makes it special that it matters so much when you're you know what your genes are. And, that, and that's I've made this argument in other work is there's a lot of problems that we learned about about in the 19th century, like sanitation, screens, <laughs> that could that would make an enormous difference in humanity. Like, notice how it's happening with Zika. People are like, we have to put genetic modification in Oxitec. And like, hmm, maybe we should get screens on houses in Florida and don't have them. And maybe we should have, you know, not have open sewers in Brazil. And so notice the 19th century things haven't been done first. Yeah, genomic is important. Maybe that's our last hope. But it, it reduces the problem to one of the chemistry when it becomes much more subtle. So that, that, and that's, that, it's interesting to give this much attention. But you guys are just a bit of this, so of course you get on this. Yeah, so given that you know, private funding of science exists, and uh, so there are these private entrepreneurs who want to do anything that are sort of about technology, what responsibility do ethicists have to reach out to those people? And, like, how, how do you talk to those people when you sort of fundamentally disagree with the basis of their wealth and that their economic system. They're allowed to get rich, but they have tax tax structure. Right? It's all a tax structure. That's why science that's why, you know, human avenue has these huge problems. And I mean, they're saying, why does it look like this? Right? Why is why does the bridge is hold? <laughs> the same problem. It's not just science. Right? So it's you have to you have to on some level you have to work for Right? And yeah, that's, that's the most single most important thing that a scientist could do is be a good citizen. But and it's also, it's not a given. Right? It seems to all of you in this room like, well, of course, private people will fund science. But it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that pretty, like, not so very long ago. No, people didn't do that. Now it's like the Medici's funding the, the, you know, the Italian Renaissance. <laughs> but, like, that wasn't what science was like. You got your grant. You got your grant. You wrote your grant. You got the NHHMI grant. That's how science was funded. It wasn't like, like, you know, biotech millionaires running around, sprinkling money about. That just wasn't that. That economy wasn't there. And now it just seems so fixed. Like, of course we have to take. So I just got a call from um, from um, Andy Paul at the New York Times guy, science guy, right? And he said, what are the ethics of when someone millionaire gives money to fund a clinical trial so he can be in? So that, and I said, no, you're not the first person to ask that question, because that becomes, that's the most naked use of this. But look, if you have a project, and you want to get funded, of course you're going to go out in the existing structure and do the best you can. And I'm not saying you have to become a vegetarian so you don't take money, because that's, that's the structure now. You as an individual, it's just, it's just stupid not to partake in the existing reality, but you have to try to change the reality as a citizen. Yes. Yeah, just... So I, I agree with the, the premise of the funding, but like, for example, HHMI was mm -hmm. created as like a tax dodger. Yes, exactly. And I know most like most of history scientists were wealthy people of hobbies. Rockefeller Institute. Yeah. And there's a brief period of time yeah. post World War II with more big funding. It seems we're moving away from that. Yeah. And I guess less challenging to kind of challenge the premise, but like, how do we make that not? some exceptional period of time, mm -hmm. which had its own problems, mm -hmm. like we could do science still, but like how to kind of bring back some of that while maintaining a more inclusive environment for more people to do science. Yeah. 
Well, one way, anyway, I mean, I think has to do with your, the integrity of scientists, right? Like you have to insist on what you're interested in doing and not what the rich person wants, right? That would be one way to think about it. If you just, if you just, like, and I'm not saying, by the way, I want to make it clear that bioethicists fall into the exact same pattern as scientists, right? Why did I be interested in, in the Human Genome Project? Because the Human Genome Project had a huge percentage, a huge, not for, in reality, but for us, it seemed like it was 50%, 5%, some percentage of that millions and millions of dollars went to bioethics. So we all wrote a paper about that, and we all got a little bit of money to do a project on the Human Genome Project. Same kind of thing. Our research driven by what's what's funded, what's available. Whereas in the American foster care system, you know, we care about embryos but not about children in the foster care system, so we don't know what to do about them because we don't study them because there was no money. So it's it's a very, very tough problem. How do you how do you study what's genuinely important and yet like, survives in, in the world of academia? And I think I think to be aware of it always is really it's going to be I mean, I mean, only your awareness and your capacity to work as a citizen is important. That's it. I did write a paper on the foster care system because I felt so bad that I spent all the summer embryos and nothing on actual children. But that meant that it wasn't a funded piece of work, which is something that I researched and did on my own. So that's part of it. But you're right, Darwin was able to be Darwin because he was independently wealthy. You know, um, banks were taken with banks for the same reason. But not, every, not all of them in the early 19th century, not all of them in that situation, but most of them. That's how science is funded. It's a project of all of them. Okay, do you want to do this, by the way? Do you want to make a human genome? <laughs> Learning, isn't it? <laughs> yes, you had a question? It was raising your hand, but just Okay. Me? Yeah, you? Yeah, well, I, I was just thinking about that question if I want to make a human genome. <laughs> but I was. I was going to say, yeah, for, for me, I I want to make a large genome, but, but that's shaped by my you know, experiences. Like, that. like, I think that everyone brings their own, like, religious or at least moral code into it. And as you mentioned, I think that for me it's the soul space in a way that we don't always acknowledge because we're not allowed to inside the Yeah. Look, I, I, of course it's interesting, right? Because it's see how larger genome maybe. Not that we're the largest. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to ask a side question, just because you brought it up in all your conversation about who has power and access. Yeah. Maybe curious, but with the OxyTech um, and voting in Florida to release mosquitoes, like, I know as a bioethicist, it's probably easy to be on the side of, let's, let's hold off on that to do these other solutions first. Um, what would be an ideal way to decide that a gene drive type organism is okay? What would be the ideal model from yeah. your so perspective? So let's put aside Ossetech for a second. Okay. And I'm actually going to sign on to work for free, of course, because I'm going to have a sister. With Austin Burke and his project in the um, University of California, you know, that's a gene drive project with malaria. And he's been, he's been working on this for like 17 years. And he has population geneticists and outreach workers and African community workers and social workers. And he has the people in the African villages in three countries gathering the existing mosquitoes and paying them to bring them in. And they have a very elaborate project to create a gene drive for, um, for them, right? And wiping out that species, hopefully. If we got it. Um, I'm not opposed to wiping out the species. I, I'm in California and I'm really glad with all the grizzly bears or in zoos and the Yellowstone, right? Because it was a scary, dangerous species. They had wandering around over the elephant. Um, tigers in India, whatever. But I'm saying it's like there's something inherently in principle wrong about eliminating a species that is incredibly threatening. And you can keep a little zoo of Gambria or <laughs> mosquitoes if you want. They'd be fine if they didn't have us. We're, we're the host, right? so they're just effective. So they'd be fine just without the people. So I think that's a good example. Now, I'm, I'm like known in the field as a very pro-science person, right? You know, me as a, I was like for stem cells. I, I love synthetic biology. I, I think it's a many projects that would be unethical to stop. I don't think that human genome is one, but I think there's many projects that would be unethical to stand in front of. And the, the gene drive is a very good example. Oxy takes a little bit for profit, and they have a replacement model, not an elimination model. So it's a 
I'm not sure that that's that's sufficient, but I'm I support their efforts for just that reason. I think I think these edges of drift are a problem. The area is even worse, and I think a gene drive is um, is a naturally occurring phenomenon that can be harnessed in an interesting way. I think the um, the, the um, immune system mice for Lyme disease is an interesting project, and that's from the church lab actually, from someone who was in the church lab, and that's a really good use of science, and he did lots of public engagement, and it's all on an island, and you can see there's many many uses of biology that are now entering into the CRISPR-Cas9, entering into our actual world, and making changes that are significant. So the world, I think we'll be better with the Lyme disease and malaria, or Zika. I think you just yeah, I'd be better. Yellow fever is a problem now too. So these gene drives on mosquitoes is very important in the next decade. Malaria wasn't so much of a problem. It's a good kind of yeah, yeah, sure. It's yeah, there's some person. There we go. Yes. Um, so I'm just curious if if you could have constructed the gene that was helped in like the perfect way and by the perfect. Uh, a lot of people, how, I guess, how would, how would you go about that? How would you go about organizing it? Um, I guess, um, maybe add a little less faith than just large governmental bodies. Yeah. Then you do get there's corruption, well, there's corruption in that. But yeah. So at some point, someone's making some decisions and may have ties to other stuff. I guess, mm -hmm. what what's the philosophically rigorous way to go about it? It's a really interesting project that I was, I was trying to do one here, actually for next month, but we didn't do it, but you know, there was changes, there's reasons why we didn't do it, it was too fast, but you would invite the people who were most, um, had spent the most time thinking about this, you would live stream it, you would have a video that edited tapes, <laughs> you would live stream the event, um, you would do it like they did at the Christopher Cats 9 meeting in the National Academies, and if you felt anxious, you'd have a National Academy, you'd have it run by not only National Academies of Science, but bioethics um, and religious well, participation too, and those those academies, the National you know, American Academy of Religion, bioethics academies, they would be involved in putting it together. That I think would be ideal. Right? So not only the self-organization of science, but the self-organization of, of theologians and the self-organization of um, ethicists. You know, and then you would make it accessible. Anybody that wanted to contribute would have to write write something and submit it. And so then you have a repository of people's written on the record ideas that could be shared. But, and I would invite them from the PTA, the local PTA. And I would invite them from the local trade union. Right? I would have the guys who clean this apartment in this um, room make sure that they really heard what they thought too, not just an only this place. So when I did bioethics in, um, in, clinical, in clinical medicine, we always had people from the janitorial staff participate in too because it's their world as well. So that's there's ways to make it different. There's ways to change these ways. Yeah. Okay. And you can all come. <laughs> okay. Thanks for asking me. I'm very happy that you're all here and she's the head of biology and happy to be part of this.